Okay, good afternoon to you all. I hope that you all can see me and hear me well. And I would like to welcome you to the panel called From Disinformation to Polarization, the very last panel of the Chernian Security Forum 2021. My name is Jan Daniel. I'm a researcher at the Institute of International Relations Prague, and I will be chairing this panel. It is always difficult to be at the last panel of the conference, but uh, I believe that this time it is actually even more challenging as we have to keep up with all the excellent panels that we had here before with interesting presentations and with all the great things that were said here. Um, thanks, Polly. We have a range of exciting and important topics to discuss, so I hope that our audience uh, won't even notice that we are in the last panel. Well, we live with uh, public debate about disinformation and we live with a, let's say, threat of disinformation for already quite some time. Yet, it is an issue that keeps mutating constantly, partly due to technology. Um, by technology, I mean all the innovations in the social media, I mean all the innovations in terms of uh, different types of media manipulation, or even, let's say, new tools that are supposed to finally solve all of these and are supposed to solve the problem of digital disinformation for the wider public. However, these new developments uh, are also caused by the issues that we encounter or even that we encounter in the real world, not only in the, in the digital one. And the real world always reminds us that there are many false claims circulating online and offline. Uh, this information related to the coronavirus pandemic is a clear example of all this. And these have also a very uh, clear and very real impact beyond the digital sphere. Well, th uh, this panel is supposed to map at least some of these current developments and some of these current, current trends in uh, online disinformation and their social and political effects. We thus asked our panelists what they see as the most, as some of the most important trends in disinformation nowadays, meaning digital disinformation, and what do we perhaps get wrong about it? So basically, we keep hearing about new digital threats, we keep hearing about new digital security issues related to disinformation, but are they really such an important topic for discussion or are they a mere distraction? However, we also asked them to at least a map briefly what we are doing about it and maybe what should be perhaps done differently. Uh, we have four excellent panelists who have been in different forms involved with these topics already for many years and who will help to help us to unpack these topics. Uh, first, we have uh, Alexi Drew. Um, hello. Uh, she completed her PhD at uh, Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, and her dissertation was on emerging technologies and their security and geopolitical implications. And now she works as a senior analyst at RAND Europe, uh, working in the area of defense, security, infrastructure, and more specifically covers issues such as global supply chains and cyber security risk, also misinformation campaigns, among other in Northern Africa. Um, as a second speaker, we have uh, Oyana Popescu, who is the uh, director of Global Focus Center uh, an independent foreign policy think tank in Bucharest, Romania. And Oana has a very interesting career behind her because uh, she has previously served as a state secretary for EU affairs, uh, foreign policy advisor to the president of Romanian Senate, and also a program director of Aspen Institute, Romania. As a third speaker, um, we have a, also a very uh, interesting um, figure, let's say, uh, Michael Boni, who is a former Minister of Administration and Digitalization of Poland between the years 2011 and 2013. And as I learned, he was the first Minister of Digital Affairs in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, after that, he was a member of the European Parliament between 2014 and 2019. And in his uh, career, in his research, he has covered many areas of uh, different emerging technologies, among others, the debate about 5G networks or about digitalization as such. As our last speaker, we have uh, anne Catherine Riedel, uh, who is a chairwoman of uh, the Association for Liberal in Internet Policy and vice president of the European Society for Digital Sovereignty. Uh, 
Currently, as a manager of the Global Teams Division of Friedrich Neumann Foundation for Freedom, she deals with the issues of digitalization, innovation, and their ethics on a European and global level, if I'm not mistaken. Right, uh, each of our panelists will have, uh, have about 10 to 15 minutes for their initial presentation or initial remarks, uh, mapping what they perceive as the most important current trends in online uh, disinformation and ways how to, how to tackle them. And after that, we will proceed to the Q&A. Um, I believe that now, without further ado, we can proceed to our first presentation today, which will be delivered by Alexey Drew. So Alexey, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for such a great summary and an introduction. Um, I always do enjoy being the very last um, subject of the day. It is a bit of a challenge, but it's a, um, I think it's one between the four of us we can certainly meet. So I, I don't want to take up too much time, but obviously the idea is for me to kind of summarize from what I've seen in this space to be the predominant issues and how trends in disinformation have been adapting over the past um, couple of years. And some of the things that we've seen um, coming out as, as means potentially of engaging with those emergent trends and changes as a, as a positive way of, of solving these issues. Now, um, I say a couple of years and anyone who works in this space will instantly probably state that a couple of years in this, in this area is a very long time. And lots of things can happen in two years or three years. And we've seen drastic shifts in all sorts of dynamics around um, disinformation and influence operations just during the two years or two and a half years or so of, during the pandemic. And a lot of that, I think, um, obviously is, is not been demonstrated um, directly yet, but comes out of a change in the way that um, we as individuals and societies and cultures and groups engage with media and how we've had to engage with media as a result of a, of a kind of shift of how we've interacted in general because of COVID and lockdown and how certain forms or types of information have become very critical to not just our interactions socially, but our interactions in terms of public health and security have become very prominent. So there are a few things that I would initially summarize that have changed or are changing. And then I'm going to kind of dive into just maybe one or two of those rather than all of it. So I'd say that things that are changing in disinformation and have changed relatively rapidly in the last couple of years, a change in targets, that disinformation and information operations and influence operations, whatever you want to use the terminology, are increasing in the scope and direction of their targeting. It's not just now international, it also includes domestic, local, um, internal misinformation campaigns targeting domestic audiences, and it changes on the level of interaction and evolving targets. So particular issues can be targeted, which is a bit more granular than we might have seen previously in the more prominent cases. We've seen a change in goals in that disinformation is no longer purely about causing social fracture or division, or maybe influencing the outcome of an election. The, the intention of these things has diversified as the actors th themselves involved have similarly diversified, which leads on to the fact that the actors engaged in influence operations are far broader than they might once have seemed. That we have not just states involved now, we have disinformation and influence for hire becoming more prominent and a, a critical component for us to be concerned about. And we also have the um, essentially a movement towards um, those who are also not only taking part in these campaigns and designing them, but those who are analyzing them and pointing out um, the trends are changing. We're seeing a proliferation of groups taking part in the attribution of influence operations, which again is a, a different dynamic and one to be concerned with or interested in. And the final bit to kind of think about or area I think to consider, which is covered briefly in the introduction to this particular panel, is that the mitigation strategies and the governance of of information spaces is changing. And the information landscape itself is developing alongside that, not necessarily at the same pace. Um, anyone who works in governance would, would love to say that governance regimes and, and um, methods evolve at the same pace and can keep up with, with things that we see happening, new platforms coming to market, new dynamics of interaction and, and risk and issues we identify. But unfortunately, that's never the case. But these two things are 
feeding into each other. And this is the area that I really want to kind of draw in on for me is that there is a lot of promising direction of travel. And there are others that we we really have dropped the ball on. So I'm going to leave the positive for last so I can end on a positive note. But the negative ones really comes down to this, the, the fracturing, if you like, of different issues into systems think that mean that we think of these problems as technical um, and we don't see them as a, a whole societal issue. So as a, as a case in point, we see... Um, at the moment, the EU, for example, is considering or is engaging in the concept of how do we create governance around um, targeted marketing campaigns and targeted advertising? And how do we make it so that the individuals targeted are more aware of their targeting? The data is actually transparent in the manner it's collected and it's used. And people are aware of the implications of marketed um, personal information and how that can then feed into how they operate in this digitized world. Now, that might seem from the outside completely unrelated to the topic of mis and disinformation, but in reality, one of the trends we've seen with the dynamics of how these, these campaigns are often designed is that they're increasingly tailored to specific target audiences. And the way that you best do that is by gathering as much information as you can as to the behaviors and patterns of behavior of these same audiences, their interests, their likes, their dislikes, because because through that you can gain understanding of how to influence them and how to tailor your messaging appropriately. And we've seen this with example in the UK with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and we've seen it in other examples where tailored marketing information is collected in a manner and then used for essentially politicized marketing, that is an influence operation. And we've also seen governance beginning to develop in the EU about targeted marketing. And we've seen it coming up in the US as well, where we have increasingly um, an effort to understand um, the gap by current legislature, which says that, for example, um, American citizens can't have personal information collected them by the state, but that doesn't stop the state buying personal information collected them by private companies and then transferred to them that way. So there are gaps in legislation and they seem a lot of these areas seem distinct and separate from information operations and disinformation but in reality they're very closely connected and there is a range of these seemingly diffuse and disconnected components of governance strategy that actually all should be considered as a part of a whole and the problem there are two problems that have been considered separately. One is that we don't perhaps give them as much impetus and importance and time and capacity as, as we should, both being academics or governments or policymakers or third sector. And two, they then seem, they then take a much more disconnected approach where some regions will do some work, such as the EU and its targeted advertising. Some will do others, such as the current um, thoughts in the US with regards to closing this loophole of transfer of private information to the state. But in reality, we need to be considering this in a joined up way because information operations and the information ecosystem is not something which is generally beholden to the national boundaries of governance structures that aren't cross-cutting and international. So I said I'd, I'd end on a positive, which in many cases is quite hard to do, but I'm gonna give it a good shot in this case. And I, I think what it's important to state is that although there is still a lag, although we still see um, governance playing catch up to the reality of the risks that we are seeing and interpreting from modern influence campaigns and the risks of the, the information ecosystem that we rely upon now for very critical information such as public health. We are seeing at least an increased understanding of its importance and we are beginning to see some stakeholders across the range of types of stakeholder involved, that being industry, government, third sector, and um, institu international institutions starting to actually realize that they have joint responsibility towards this. It's not simply, simply a, a matter for governments to solve. It's not simply a matter for activist groups to raise attention of, nor is it simply an issue of the industry using a technical solution to a, what is perceived to be a technical problem when in reality there's a not very strong non-technical component. And we are finally beginning to see actually that shift away. And that is a, as a positive direction. 
my my suggestion my hope is that that direction of travel continues and in fact amplifies and can be brought together into a, a more directed joined up set of efforts towards governance targeting the vast array of technologies and dynamics that feed in to what current mis and disinformation campaigns look like um, and i'm going to leave it there and allow the others on this um, panel to actually cover some of the other potential changes and, and, and directions that we're seeing this area going in. Um, perfect. Thanks a lot, Alexei. That was a um, perfect kickoff to the panel, I would say. I was uh, very happy to hear about some of the trends that I'm actually personally interested in. And I believe that uh, the proliferation of different actors who are involved not only in, let's say, this information campaign and, and let's say, information gathering on various scales, but also proliferation of people who are trying to tackle people and institutions who are trying to tackle these issues is something that we are only slowly realizing and we don't know how to grasp yet in a, let's say more coherent manner. So I was very happy to hear about this and I hope that we'll be able to return to this in the, in the Q&A potentially. And I was also very happy to hear about you stressing that uh, this information and let's say the whole the information debate is something which is not just about technologies and not just about regulation of technologies but it's much much broader and we are only slowly i believe trying to and slowly realizing how broad it is and what we actually need to need to do there um so thanks a lot for these um let's say <clears throat> introductory remarks and uh, i will now pass the floor to uh oyana popescu to deliver her remarks Hi, um, thank you very much. I, I will try to um, pick up from um, where the previous speaker left, actually, because um, I think, indeed, you know, we um, at the Global Focus Center in, in Bucharest, we started by, by looking at the internal vulnerabilities that are um, kind of being used as potential entry points by foreign and domestic, um, for that matter, interference. And then we slowly moved in the direction of democratic resilience overall. So um, essentially, I think a lot of the, um, uh, the problems caused by disinformation, propaganda, malign influence, um, very much have to do with, with our own domestic vulnerabilities. And, and that's what makes it so difficult um, to, to fight uh, because essentially you are not in, in any form of conflict necessarily with somebody or something outside of your borders, but within your own borders. So that is what, what makes things extremely complicated. Um, and, and so I would like to stress, um, you know, not just the fact that for a large part of the um, challenges that we're facing, Many, many of them, especially uh, in Central Eastern Europe, which which I know better, um, are of a of an internal nature. Uh, but then the other uh, the other thing where I think we might be a little bit misled in in the um, vocabulary that we use is that we very much uh, brand this as disinformation, and that induces the idea that it that, that there's got to be some sort of fake news false information out there and then um the thing is that a lot of it is actually um either partly true information or even entirely true information um sometimes on which a specific spin is put uh, and and it ends up being manipulative depending on the channels that disseminated on the actors that disseminated and the interest behind it. Um, so I think, you know, especially when we look at um, the activity of China in Central Eastern Europe, if we simply look at disinformation to a large extent, you don't necessarily find disinformation that comes from China, but you do find propaganda um, and, and you do find manipulative information. So I think you know, we we need to to get our terminology right uh, to to make sure that it doesn't uh, mislead our research efforts in in the in the wrong direction. Um, so one thing you know is uh, I I do believe we are dealing very much with propaganda, and and, and perhaps less um, with disinformation or not only with disinformation. The other thing is it's it's very much homemade. Um, it's uh, and and I think. 
talking about the trends that we see, uh, not just in Romania, uh, where I'm based, but in many countries around Romania, what we see is increasingly a cooperation um, between political actors on the one hand and social actors on the other hand. Um, so groups of interests whose agendas happen to align also to uh, some extent, they, these agendas align with those of uh, foreign actors such as the Kremlins or Beijing's. Um, it, that particularly happens when uh, we are discussing anti-Western um, theories and, and narratives, when we, when we discuss the whole uh, values-based uh, um, kind of social order. Uh, I think we see increasing conservat conservatism in the region, social conservatism. Um, the, uh, the a narrative that seeks to present European Union values and, and Western values more generally uh, to traditional values and, and a certain interpretation uh, thereof, of course, uh, religious values. So all of these things, um, I, I think we see a very fluid movement. Uh, sometimes it's the political actors that feed um, bits of, of these narratives to social movements so that when when um you know when political action such as new legislative attempts are made the uh, the social context is already there uh, i will give you just an example romania unlike uh, perhaps many other countries in the region used to have this um uh, this horrible experience which which is which has caused um lasting drama to um many thousands uh, and tens of thousands of women uh in in communist times when uh we we had very strict anti-abortion laws uh and and as a result um somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 women died uh trying to to get illegal abortions and so uh, just a few years ago, you would have thought, uh, you know, a, a comeback of uh, uh, stricter abortion laws or even anti-abortion laws is unconceivable in, in Romania precisely because of this historic trauma, which our parents' generation still remembers. So it's, it's still there. It's, it's very much alive. And we have grown up with the uh, knowledge of it and, and so on and so forth. Um, and in, in fact, what we see at this point is that in 50% roughly of public hospitals, uh, it is impossible to get a, a legal abortion, even though it is not banned in any way in Romania. And that is because the law allows doctors to choose whether they want to perform um, abortions or not. Um, and so de facto, uh, you only get half a chance uh, to, to get a legal abortion. And there's a growing social movement uh, that essentially portrays um, abortion in general as, as going uh, very much against not just religious values, but traditional values. Uh, the, the value of demographic uh, growth and 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 uh, essentially an, an um, anti-patriotic uh, gesture, uh, and and so we haven't had anything happen on a legislative level yet uh, of the kind that we saw in Poland and Hungary, but I'm pretty sure that when we do, uh, and and that moment might not be very far uh, into the future because we've just recently uh, invented, I, I, I think that happened uh, less than a week ago, this uh, new ministry for the family, uh, whose uh, minister, whose leading minister is the, the only woman in this cabinet. Uh, and she's a very strong proponent of social conservatism and ultra religious values. So we might very well in the next year or so see uh, legislative initiatives in the direction of banning abortion. Uh, and then the social context, as you, can, as you can see, is already there. It's been created. The stakeholders within society that are ready to support something like that are there. Um, so this is, I think, one of the new trends that we're seeing. It's, it's a, um, a kind of a network um, of uh, of uh, disinformation actors that comprises 
uh, really political um, actors and social movements and social influencers, whether they be artists or, or uh, you know, football fans or uh, musicians, um, uh, all of them helping to disseminate these ideas in a way that when um, when the moment is ripe for something with a clear political objective, then the whole ecosystem is in place to support that. Uh, and that I think is very worrying because indeed, as has been said before, on the other level, on the level of governance, we still very much operate in silos. We still very much, um, for instance, uh, separate, not just, uh, I, I mean, let alone that there's not really a whole of society approach, sometimes not even a whole of government approach, um, and that we don't understand well enough the audiences that, that we are supposed to be targeting. But there's also a very clear cut separation between counter disinformation and strategic communications. And of course, to a large extent, there should be, I mean, it is two different uh, topics, but then uh, when you do strategic communications, you should have in mind um, that, that this is also one of the strongest instruments to counter disinformation. And that brings me to the efforts that we're, that we're making and, and especially those that we're not making um, to, to counter this. And, and I believe there is very much uh, being spoken about um, counter disinformation efforts, where uh, that is to say reactive, a, a reactive uh, position, and much less about strategic communications and, and how, um, what we should be doing to make sure that we occupy the public communication space with the scientifically validated message, with the official message, with the message that respects public interest. Um, so we we often get asked as as experts in uh, disinformation, you know, what what is there to to be done? And uh, um, and and I think very often um, experts in general tend to go for the low hanging fruit, which is um, fact checking, debunking. Um, trying to identify uh, per perhaps the perpetrators to, to some extent. Um, the whole discussion that um, still I, I believe we are avoiding to, to a large extent even, even there between regulating uh, the, the online space uh, additionally and freedom of, of uh, expression and of information. Um, but it is much more seldom that we hear the answer. Well, you know, I mean, all of these reactive measures are only be are only going to be able to mitigate the threat to some extent um and and we're not gonna win this and we're not gonna regain the upper hand uh before we actually learn how to do strategic communications and and how to be uh proactive rather than reactive and and i think that involves a, a two-pronged uh, response one of them uh, is on the resilience um, side and the other one is on the response side. Um, I think, you know, I, I know these um, sound like very theoretical um, ideas, but uh, we can go more into that and it's uh, on a case by case basis, really depending on context uh, during the, uh, the interactive part of our debate. Uh, but we need to raise costs for the perpetrators. We need to make it more difficult. We're not going to foolproof our societies against disinformation and manipulation, but we can um, make it more difficult and we can use both um, social and political means and uh, the technology at hand. And then on the other hand, um, although it's discouraging for many, because when you say let's build resilience, that actually means closing vulnerability gaps that have been um, building up for decades and, and, and that we have neglected to a large extent. And of course, then we're not going to be able to fix them overnight. Uh, but it's an effort that needs to start. So clearly, we need to build resilience and, and we need to close those entry points um, for uh, malign influence. And, and to do so, obviously, we need to prioritize and to understand not just what is our list of vulnerabilities, but what are the priority vulnerabilities that are either more likely to be um, instrumentalized by our opponents or likely to cause the most damage? 
So um, I, I think we there is there is very much um, still to do uh, both for national governments, for civil society, for the EU and, and NATO um, in really getting the, the, the framework clear and, and understanding again on a case by case basis. This is very context dependent. Um, what the what the most immediate threats are, what the threats that, for instance, in our societies cause, um, as in mine, very low uh, vaccination rates and, and very high death rates uh, because of COVID um, and, and, you know, all the vaccine skepticism, refusal to follow measures and, and so on and so forth. So to understand what are the ones that are likely to wreak havoc in our societies in the near future um, and, and deal with those first. Uh, I will close not on an optimistic note, I'm afraid, but rather on a pessimistic note by saying that um, I think if we look at the if we look at the migration crisis on the border of Belarus and Poland um, to, to see whether when we are faced with this very blatant use of migration as an instrument, as a hybrid instrument to attack our societies, and if we look at that and, and, and we see that there is reaction by international actors, I think that's a pretty good, in, that, that's going to give us a pretty good indication whether um, governments and, and international organizations are going to move on disinformation and, and manipulation of information um, when there is a crisis on our hands, so only when something really bad strikes us, or if there is a chance that we might have really understood that uh, this is going to be really the the uh, the face of conflict in in the near future. It's going to be very much hybrid. It's going to be asymmetric. It's not necessarily going to be conventional. So we should really put much more energy into um, into preventing and countering that. Uh, but I think, again, this is uh, really something I'm, I'm still waiting to see. And, and I, I take this, this migration crisis in Europe as an indicator of whether nations have understood this uh, or uh, we're still following the old rule. When there's a crisis, we try to deal with it as best we can. If we don't have a crisis, then we don't have anything to... Uh, um, to hurry um, to tackle. Um, perfect. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna. That was uh, that was terrific. I really like. Uh, first of all, I really like to hear perspective from our region, from the Central and Eastern Europe. Again, something that we will hear uh, later. Um, also, also again from from Michal. But uh, what I really liked here is um, that I liked how you wrote on the debate to also purely domestic affairs. Uh, I really liked that how you said that um, well, no one wants to fight domestic problems. It's something which is uh, sometimes it's much easier to look the other way or look outside basically when we have so much dirty laundry, I believe, to deal with in our own ho own homes. And that uh, hard work actually begins at home here in our own nations to try to understand why people find certain things appealing, why some form of disinformation um, I say spread so fast and so wide. Um, and also I like how you mentioned that also domestic actors are to be blamed for spreading disinformation. So definitely it's something that we see not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but that we see everywhere basically. Um, having spent some months recently in Italy, that's the thing that we see from Italian populists as much as we see it in, uh, in Romania or Czech Republic. But also it kind of opens a question for me that I will uh, probably ask later. So if we are tackling these things at home, where do actually politics end and where do disinformation start? Because uh, as much as I might be on your ideological side, some of the questions that you mentioned are sort of a purely political question. And as much as I share many of liberal values, or probably like all of them, uh, some of them are basically political questions that we should be able to debate at some point. So where does that leave us with strategic communication and uh, trying to tackling different ideological opinions, I guess? Um, but again, something I will be uh, something that I will be very happy to return to in, uh, in uh, Q&A. And now I would like to pass the floor to, to Michal Boni for his remarks. 
First of all, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much, uh, Alexei and Oana, for the very inspiring uh, introductory remarks. Uh, I think that uh, it was very, very important uh, to understand what kind of drastic shift we have, uh, what kind of uh, targeted audience we can recognize when we are discussing about this information, and also if we have uh, mitigation strategies. And uh, I want to, to add something what uh, Oana uh, uh, presented. Uh, uh, it is uh, about narratives. When uh, I'm asking if uh, Polish uh, society is understanding the migration crisis uh, uh, um, uh, related to the border, Belarus border, Polish border, uh, I'm also, uh, and first of all, should ask if Polish government understands this, uh, this problem, because I think that for the Polish government, uh, uh, it is much more important to create narrative that we as Poland are, uh, 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 that there are some threats for Pol Poland as, as a state and we need to discuss about the war. At the same time, during this uh, migration crisis, uh, the Polish government presented the new legislation related to the military issue. Uh, uh, my identification of this uh, portfolio is related to uh, um, uh, that this is some kind of uh, set of tools which are important for the authoritarian government. But coming back to, to, to our question, uh, uh, and uh, relation between disinformation and polarization, I want to focus on one aspect, how disinformation can establish and uh, amplify the social and political, first of all, political disinformation. Three general points at the very beginning. The principle divide et impera uh, exists through many years, and was a very useful tool uh, to govern the societies and to keep the power by the authorities. The, in the history, we have experienced many phenomena of social divide based on various sets of reasons, social, religious, cultural, etc. And the extreme form of social division, of social divide, means extreme polarization. Uh, uh, in our times, it is uh, amplified by manipulative tools, propaganda, and also uh, uh, used uh, propaganda used and disseminated not only by media, politicians, but also uh, uh, the internet tools. Uh, considering the conditions supportive for the growing polarization and the significance of the populism, I want to join those two. Uh, uh, meanings, polarization and two words, polarization and populism. We should analyze the deep socio-cultural reasons. Firstly, the increasing waves of threats and fears coming from the lack of understanding of the modern world and its characteristic. The globalization with the power to destroy local values the technology revolution and no possibility to adapt to the faster and faster technological changes. In our part of Europe, societies, the part of them are tired and were tired by transformation reforms. And also the new era of uh, work in coming related to the automation and robotization. So there are the threats those threats build some emotional and paradoxically rational reactions as the lack of certainty in the part of society and security which lead to the presumption of the unknown future and the lack of hope. The lack of trust to the public authorities, institutions and elites which leads to the low level of the social capital. The feeling that there are more losers 
then beneficiaries of the modern way of the development, also of the transformation in our countries, which established the need to change the situation by giving the power by elections to the populistic leaders. In addition, those processes are supported by the weaknesses of the media and education systems to explain the world in a positive way. And also, uh, it is important and uh, supportive, uh, uh, unfortunately, the real growth of uh, inequalities in many societies, new forms of exclusions uh, are appearing. Generally speaking, it creates the social background for populism and open the so-called social readiness for the post-truth era. The power of populism is based on real, in this understanding, uh, social background, but the mechanism of influence on people looks like. The threats are amplified by political messages and political narratives, by media, by propaganda, and especially by manipulative internet use, by organized, industrialized disinformation coming uh, also from outside the country, as uh, Putin cases show. The emotional messages are crucial to build some kind of community of threatened people, threatened by insecurity and uncertainty. This community is empowered by indicating the scapegoats, establishment, and enemies. Uh, it is uh, the worse sort of the society, of the Polish society, as the leader of the Populist Party in Poland, Kaczynski, presented, indicating by, indicated uh, uh, the democratic opposition. Having the enemy is the tool for the uh, unification of the part of the society. And the key solution, the Faustian deal, those people, the big part of the society is ready to exchange the freedom for security. Why is it so important? Because it opens the door for the neo-authoritarian model of governance, undermining in the name of security and the needs of the usual people the rule of law, the transparency of governance, the citizens' rights, and the rights of the society to be diversified. As we can see, the internet disinformation, various types of disinformation and fake news, is disseminated very fastly, also by using bots and uh, with no alternative to explain what is really true. The internet disinformation is creating the most adequate background for this Faustian deal. And the internet forms are creating social media, Twitter groups, behavioral factors used to indicate the echo chamber groups and uh, silos and establish the closed bubble groups. Divisions and extreme polarization. The extreme polarization, on the other hand, is based on social divide, as I have mentioned, amplified by internet tools, which undermines the democracy. How it works? The democracy does not mean only the result of the election and the election per se. The democracy requires to have respect, full respect, to the minorities after taking majority of the power in the election. Operation is one of the key aspects of the democracy. The democracy requires to solve the problems, which means involve representatives of different kinds of social interests 
through dialogue. The extreme polarization is blocking the opportunities of the dialogue because people, groups of different views on the problems are treated as enemies. Instead of peaceful dialogue, the extreme polarization is organizing the permanent war, the permanent fight, the permanent battle. And of course, internet tools used by people uh, are amplifying those trends. How we can tackle, because it's also very important to understand if we are completely out of the possibility to mitigate those threats, or we have some possibilities. How can we tackle the disinformation, trying to minimize the extreme polarization as a tool for undemocratic governance and new undemocratic customs and habits? First of all, we need to care about the balance between the freedom of speech and instruments used to remove the content close to the disinformation mode. It is important uh, as, it is, uh, as it functions to involve uh, in the network all partners to assess, indicate and flag some contents, contents which is uh, the representation of disinformation. If 83% of Europeans people in Europe, in the European Union, think uh, that disinformation threatens democracy. If 51% due to Eurobarometer of Europeans think they have been exposed to disinformation online, and if disinformation uh, is hampering citizens' ability to make informed decisions and eroding trust, and impairing freedom of expressions, it is clear that we have to act. There are some possibilities. In the European Union, we have from uh, 2018, the code of practice on disinformation, I want to remind it, and it is developing. It is the form of the self-regulation with some achievements, empowering consumers, empowering researchers and fact checkers, developing signatories, also private messaging uh, services, reporting quality of standardized information, and some currently now discussed uh, measures, demonetize, demonetizing disinformation and increasing scrutiny of advertising placement. I think this kind of defunct of disinformation is very important issue. Increasing the transparency of political advertising, the total ban of targeted political advertisement in consider, is considered and discussed in the European Parliament. Increasing the coverage of fact-checking across European Union countries and languages, it's also important. Providing researchers with increased access to data to know more and to prepare and discuss about counteracting uh, 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 against the disinformation. And labeling of content identified as a false. Of course, uh, as uh, uh, previous speakers said, there is some kind of limited mitigation of disinformation. We need to be much more proactive. And of course, we need probably to have a much more clear regulatory framework. So the discussion on Digital Services Act is also related to the problem of disinformation and it's creating uh, the legal conditions to remove some types of the content from the network. But it will be not so easy to define in the legal way all of those disinformation contents. Finally, what I want to say is that uh, we need to understand that, firstly, resilience, uh, democratic resilience, uh, as uh, Oana mentioned, uh, uh, should be based, first of all, on the awareness of the people and education. And uh, secondly, we need to understand that uh, some kind of common 
joint responsibility of us as citizens and our organizations, governments ready to, to fight with this information, uh, and European Union institutions uh, 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 should go together hand in hand, uh, arm in arm, uh, if we want to achieve our goals and uh, minimize some uh, 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 effects and results of the disinformation and a little stop the disinformation which is uh, uh, creating uh, the polarization and polarization which is undermining the democracy. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Thanks a lot, Michal. That was uh, also a very broad uh, and actually broad and at the same time detailed analysis of what's wrong with our societies and moreover also what needs to be done so i really like the conclusion uh where you also mentioned the potential way forward so i hope that there are some policymakers who are listening to us and who are taking notes and not only that but also who will who will uh act on that and uh but from your presentation i really liked the let's say social analysis of the problem and uh, mentioning um, that it's not only about its information it's about the weakness of uh, our media systems basically and it's also about real grievances let's say and real lack of hope of certain parts of society be who basically don't have a reason nowadays to trust the state because it's not working for them and what to do with that might be actually a much bigger question um, I also have a let's say question that I will ask again after the after the end of the introductory remarks. But uh, w when I was listening to you, I look, agreed with a lot of things. But also, I don't. I would probably push you in a way that uh, when we are speaking about polarization, that's not only the issue of uh, social media. When we look, for instance, at uh, such a polarized society like the one in the United States. Uh, what driving polarization there, it's also, let's say, big private media, as much as fault of uh, Twitter as it is of Fox News or CNN. So what do you want to do with, uh, so, so what should be done then with normal media, let's say, not the social ones. But again, it's something that we might want to leave for debate. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to our last speaker, uh, anne Katrin Riedel. Anne, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan, and uh, also thank you to my um, fellow panelists. There was a question in the beginning of the panel, like, um, do we enter a new era of, of uh, post-truth politics? And um, in the beginning of this year, um, I was able to read a book of Hannah Arendt, or better to say an essay of her, um, about lying and truth and politics. And sh she said something I think that is very important that truthfulness has never been a political virtue. Um, in contrast, lying was always considered a permissible means in politics. Um, so this um, lying, and I, I would say lying is not the same as disinformation, um, was always a part in, in politics, so not saying the truth, let's say it this way. And we always um, had propaganda in politics. And what I like to say is that um, what is new, what is new in this era is the speed when we share information, the amplification of information in general, that everyone is able um, to send out information to millions of people and that we all as, uh, as human beings, as citizens, have to deal in a different way with information. We are not only consuming information that was maybe checked and um, prepared by a journalist, but we have to be um, journalists and fact checkers and everything around uh, dealing with information by ourselves. And I think these are the most important things that changed. Um, so this is a, a very, very uh, interesting uh, essay of Hannah Arendt, Lying in Politics, and um, Reflections on the Pentagon Papers um, from 1971. I recommend uh, to everyone to read it. Very interesting also for this times. And um, I would bring 
in some some um, points from from my German perspective. Um, so we here in Germany um, recognize that there's a big problem with this disinformation, especially since the pandemic in uh, 2020. And uh, also again, during um, the federal election we had just in uh, in September here also there we had to deal with a, um, some disinformation, um, but uh, people just are beginning to recognize that there is a problem and a, a huge problem with disinformation um, also in this country and especially in the world, but I will come to it um, later on. Um, Moana said um, that that um, we need to get a terminology right and I think there is where the problems um, always start also here in, in Germany, people aren't really aware about the terminology and why we should be aware um, in, in, in using the right terms, especially when we want to find solutions. So um, uh, politicians are dealing with words like fake news and blaming everyone that uh, he or she spreads fake news, even though someone says just something wrong what can happen because people make mistakes and also politicians make mistakes and we get a very, very bad climate of um, societal and political discourse if we blame everyone um, to spread fake news, even though people make mistakes, especially in this um, in this very uncertain time of a pandemic where no one knows everything and when we have to deal with mistakes and, 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 and uncertainty. Um, and what I think is also a big problem, and I have some examples, uh, um, uh, sadly, in German, is that we, that, that's my impression, we always think that disinformation or being available for disinformation is a problem of the others, of maybe stupid people or people who are not really well educated or something like that. But everyone, every one of us is uh, can be a victim of disinformation because it affects you in an emotional way. And that's the problem, that we are not really aware of this. We think if we are just intelligent, we would check uh, that something is a disinformation or false information or a conspiracy theory. But if it fits to our um, wor worldview, for, ex uh, for example, we, we have this... Um, Every one of us has the spice. We are all affected by this. So here's a, an example I just found a few days on Twitter. So um, Georgine Kellermann is a, a famous German uh, journalist, and she spread this two pictures from the uh, clinic in Munich that said SOS, and, and the other one is uh, let's get vac vaccinated because um, we have really, really high numbers, especially in Bavaria. And... Um, this, uh, this tweet was shared a, a lot of times. You can see uh, the numbers, um, but this, it was fake. It was a, a manipulation uh, with Photoshop by people from, um, from, the, from the clinic. So it's, it's not a very bad um, um, a, a manipulation, um, but we, we share it because it fits to our world. We, we want people to get vaccinated and therefore we are willing to share a manipulated picture. And the clinic um, sent out some tweets and said, well, um, of course, we are um, okay with the message, but we want to say that these are manipulated pictures. Our clinic was never, there were never these lights on our clinic. So this is this is a manipulation, but no one really cared. And uh, just a few, no, not a few days ago, yesterday, um, there was the... Um, there was a new Twitter account for our uh, new states minister um, from the Greens, Claudia Roth, who sh should be become the state minister for culture and media. And um, there was a new Twitter account in her name and everyone followed this account. And uh, this is also a journalist. And he said, well, the amount of, of colleagues um, who are normally aware and, and, and able to do fact checking, share and spread the fake account of this Miss Claudia Roth is is um it's devastating. And so you know if we are if we are willing to accept the fact we are all aware of of sharing disinformation or false information and not willing to to check information in advance. So this is a very broad problem and not a problem of the others or stupid people or the ones with a with a 
add political worldview or something like that. So we need to understand more the mechanisms, why it affects everyone and why it can affect everyone and how the uh, and how disinformation is also spread also technically. And um, Jan, you mentioned it uh, just before my presentation. It's not only a problem of social media. And um, we saw it, especially now in the pandemic here in Germany, that people printed out newspapers or flyers and, and spread them on the streets or in, in houses, in, in mailboxes. And people believe paper more than um, than as something they read on the internet and even on the internet they they um they uh believe a lot and also when it comes to online shops for example amazon and etsy they're help helping a lot to spread disinformation or especially conspiracy theories and make them more you know very valuable because if there's a book about a conspiracy theory there may be um there's something true about it um so what should governments um do um, I think it's too easy if we um, just think about, yeah, we need to do something against this information. And my fellow speakers on this panel mentioned a, a lot um, already um, that we have to look at in a, in a broader way. We need a holistic a, a approach. And um, I brought some uh, publications we made at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, um, for example, on how to counter disinformation, where um, we um, developed 10 strategic demands you can um, download the paper um, via the QR, the QR codes. And um, I think um, it's also super important to look at, at, at the platforms and um, how they affect the spread of disinformation, especially when it comes to messenger services. We saw it here in Germany, we saw it in Brazil, we saw it in, in India, um, and we see it right now when we look at uh, telegram groups here uh, in Germany. They're very close groups. They kick out people um, who want to argue um, about a, a certain fact or, or information. And, and so it's a, it's a very, very close job, and we are not able to look into those groups. We need to educate people. Of course, that's super important, but I don't think that's the only solution. And we need to focus on um, our um, communication a lot, especially when it comes to politicians and um, uh, and especially in times like this pandemic. I said this in the beginning, uh, we need to learn that um, people, also um, elites, uh, and, and uh, Michael mentioned that there's a, a big lack of trust in institutions and, and elites, and um, we need to learn that they can mistake, and they need to learn that they do mistakes, and they need to excuse themselves and explain more to the people what they are doing, why are they doing this, um, so that we can build a bit of trust through this um, um, truthfulness. And um, I also think when it comes to um, regulation, um, we should um, step away from just looking at the content. We here in Germany with our Network Enforcement Act looked a lot on, on content, but um, I think it won't get us anywhere. Of course, it is very important to look at content, but um, we need to look um, on, on, on more on the algorithms that, that amplify disinformation or hate speech or whatsoever. Um, uh, and and find solutions um, that that um, decrease the 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 um, the spread of disinformation, for example. And I think the Digital Services Act um, from the European um, Commission has a lot of good approaches, a lot of good ideas, like focused on processes and um, also seeking for new approaches, um, such as social media councils, where we can discuss maybe um, how we want to deal with disinformation um, as a society or uh, whatsoever. So I think we need to be more creative um, and, and broaden our horizon when it comes to dealing with problems in general um, on the internet, on social media platforms um, and so on. And um, that is my input. Perfect. I, I'm back in. Uh, I hope that I'm back in. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. That was uh, that was uh, fascinating, Anne. I really like the start with Arendt, <laughs> and um, yeah, lying and politics are kind of inseparable, I believe. Um, unfortunately, and that also kind of goes back to things that I was saying earlier, because I believe that. Um, um, 
that we have been encountering these issues many times before, but uh, as you all mentioned, this time it's a different, probably in scale, probably in reach to wider uh, groups of people, but something is different and we are starting, still trying to understand, understand what. Uh, the second thing I really liked about your presentation is, uh, uh, I, mean, I like the whole presentation, but the second point that I really liked and I would like to uh, repeat here is that uh, how we are nowadays forced to be actually, uh, that all, all of us are forced to be uh, fact checkers in a way. And that disinformation is in a way everyone's problem. And uh, it's, all, it's all, all sides of political aisle. So as much as I understand that um, um, it's an issue of populism, it's an issue of, uh, or closely connected to populism and that we, that populists use this information and they kind of uh, prey on them. Um, I sometimes feel that I myself am happy to fall for some disinformation. And uh, it's not only a political issue, but uh, I feel that I'm tackling disinformation every day when I'm trying to, let's say, make my mind over internet reviews of uh, when I'm trying to buy new headphones or something. And I'm trying to understand what of these things that I'm reading on the internet is actually true and which is trying to just manipulate me somehow. And that goes back to what Alexi was saying at the start of, uh, of our panel, basically. Um, it's such a broad issue nowadays uh, that kind of crosses the crosses the division between, let's say, purely politics, purely social issue, and purely uh, business issue, which um, all of you mentioned here, and all of you mentioned the close entanglements between uh, technology, society, politics, and economy in some ways, and we all agreed that, that uh, we need to think about the problem in broader ways. Um, definitely, which is something which is probably easier said than always done. And I also like that you all try to chart some way forward. And uh, some of you mentioned some specific policies that we can try to uh, put forward. But I realized that all my questions uh, to most of you are actually, they're all similar. We need to do something, but uh, who actually should done that? Um, and that's kind of uh, goes back to my issue, uh, my, my question. I would like to um, I would like to pose to Alex and you that uh, you mentioned that uh, the um, that uh, there is like a fragmented governance of uh, many of these issues nowadays. That uh, some of some some things are done by the EU, some of the things are done by the states, some of the things are already done by like ethical codexes of companies and so on. So should we try to somehow propose some sort of like unified regulatory framework or, and if so, who should do that? Uh, because, uh, and who has a kind of authority to do that? Uh, because should it be something which is truly global under the UN? And if so, are we able to do something like that? Or should it be something done by the nation states or should it be something done by the EU or actually should we try to kind of connect this fragmented governance? And I'll pose the questions for the whole panel, then I return back to you, if, if you don't mind. So this, oh, my, uh, this is my first question. Uh, the question for Oana. Um, once again, um, you mentioned how important it is to do strategic communication, how important it is to do, uh, let's say, tackling of disinformation, even as, let's say, a personal ethics. But uh, who has the legitimacy to actually do that? Who has the legitimacy to be involved in a strategic communication? And who, is the, who has the legitimacy to kind of not impose some values, but put them forward in a public sphere? And once again, that goes back to my question that I posed to, to you after your presentation, because um, that kind of goes back to politics. So is it, uh, should we all become fact checkers? But not only fact checkers, should we all become, to should we all become strategic communication communicators? And doesn't that lead to more polarization again? Um, yeah, <laughs> very broad question. I'm sorry for that, but that's what I, that's what I thought after your presentation. Um, yes, uh, to, um, to, 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 to Michael Boni, um, again, um, you said that, uh, f first of all, I would really like to hear your answer about, uh, if the regulation that we that, that you proposed for social media and i very much agree with that is that something that we should also extend to to private media 
or is that something that we should we and then again who who are we it's the state or who should we be more strict about the um inflammatory content in any public sphere whether it's put forward by the by the new york times fox news cnn uh breitbart or huffington post uh, whoever basically um and then um I would like to just challenge you on something because you said that we that uh, we are unable to give people hope and I give people who then fall to populism to hope and I agree with that but sometimes the most um, the most let's say successful politicians in the past were able to give people hope but they were also able to give people hope just to fail them uh, later which kind of then fueled the rise of the populist let's say and we see that uh, a lot in debate in Britain about the, let's say, fall of uh, third way and the fall of Blairism, Blairism that was able to give people hope just to basically fall to deliver on many promises. So how we should actually do that. And finally, um, to to Anne, um, huh. I am afraid that I was not able to give <laughs> to do a specific question when I was trying to type uh, everything here, but uh, um, I would probably like to ask you, yeah, actually, uh, you kind of answered one of the questions that we have from our audience, where people is, uh, where a member of the audience is asking um, if uh, if like the current the concerns about disinformation is something which is completely new or when we think that we started to care about that. And you quite nicely said it's not something which is completely new, although it's different. And probably I would like you to um, develop this thought a little bit more, uh, saying, okay, lying is com part of politics since forever, but what's new this time around? Um, perfect. With that being said, I think that I would like to return to return to Alexei to uh, answer. And feel free also to react to any other questions that I post here. Yeah, so thank you. So kind of to reiterate, who, who should be responsible and who has the authority for, for governance around this space? And, and, and kind of where should it work or where should it rest that responsibility? Um, the idealist in me would say that, that yes, this is possible and it should be a, a, a global effort involving everyone and that's that will definitely work and it's easy and that's the best way forwards but unfortunately the idealist in me struggles to to really compete with the growing cynic in me with regards to having worked in, in global governance for a little bit too long perhaps so there's, there's a level of complexity here that that means that that ideal solution perhaps is one certainly not easy nor is it something which is achievable in the in the short term but that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't aim for, for the best effort and do our best to achieve as close to that ideal term as we can. So I, I kind of want to, there are, there are three things or, or sources of things required, I think, to make this work in how you do governance. One is the, the source of authority and credibility. One is a source of technical expertise in terms of how to make the governance structures actually work and ensure they're practical. And the final is there needs to be a source of the kind of humanitarian principles involved here. And there are different actors that can fulfill or act as these different sources. And some have overlap and can provide more than one and others not. Now, historically, we'd like to say that the state should be the source of authority and credibility, or at least in some cases, perhaps um, international institutions that collect state together. So you mentioned the UN as an example, or the EU is another potential and, and various bodies of a similar ilk. The problem with, with this one is that the very issue we're talking about have been raised by other panelists is that by engaging in the dynamics that have, if you like, poisoned the well of the information landscape and instilled distrust and misuse these dynamics for their own gain, some states more than others, but a, a vast, great group of them, have already essentially undermined and begun to undermine their own authority and credibility in this space through their own actions, which means that it's very difficult for all the stakeholders across the interest here, society and otherwise, 
to accept the credibility that they should be able to bring to these forms of discussions. So although they should still be the source of it, they perhaps preemptively need to do some work to rebuild the credibility that they want sort of automatically brought to these for sorts of efforts. In terms of the technical expertise and the source of that, that's perhaps the easiest one to solve here is that technical governance often fails because the expectations of what is the art of the possible does not match what is actually possible because those governance strategies and and suggestions and, and legislation are built by those who simply don't understand the technical things which they are seeking to govern and what can and cannot be done. So in order to make sure that these efforts work, should we want them to move towards this ideal goal of um, a truly global effective governance regime, we need to ensure that industry is involved from the beginning, which means we need to incentivize them to do so. Some have been incentivized already by a realization of the, the ill that their platforms have caused. Um, others have said that they have been influenced to do that, but then demonstrated by their actions that they are not, in fact, incentivized to do that, which we would like them to be, which means that in terms of the state level and the institutional legal level, we need to recognize that incentivization can take different forms. It can be punitive, it can be encouragement, it can be direction, and some platforms are worthy um, sources for punitive measures and others have actually done um, as much as they can without um, the other sources of assistance we're talking about here input. And I think Twitter is a good example actually of having tried to do a good job for the right reasons, but in many cases, lacking the other inputs required have in some cases caused further complications and issues. Whereas there are other platforms, um, Facebook for one, who has talked the talk, but in many cases not actually delivered on that. And the final one, the, the sources of humanitarian principles, this is where the third sector comes in. So we're a, a fundamentally talking that what we should have is a multilateral, multi-stakeholder approach to solving this problem of, of what governance of mis and disinformation and, and fake news and all these concepts that we need to make sure we, we hold well-defined as we do this should be dealing with and it should be dealt with in that regard. It's a very difficult thing to do. I, I'm not convinced that we can bring together the disparate pieces we currently have, but at the same time, starting from scratch will take too long because governance is not a, a fast moving beast. So perhaps the best approach would actually be to try and get these in incentivization structures together for all these different types of groups and begin building bridges between the silos and knocking down the walls between them to get people working together on this issue and bringing their different sources of authority, um, credibility and technical expertise together. Um, perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Alexi. Um, let's hope that um, this will this will happen. <laughs> uh, Anna. Yeah, um, difficult questions indeed. I mean, uh, the, the question of who has the legitimacy for um, strategic communications is one which I think is at the core of finding a solution to this, because what we have in many countries, um, including especially in our region, is very low confidence in government. So then it's, it's going to be very difficult to have official figures um, convince people when, when people are, are already um, giving up on, on, um, on, on the system, on, on actually, you know, sadly, um, democracy as a system as well. I think a lot of people, even though we might not agree, um, feel that it's representative democracy itself, which is letting them down. So that's, I think that's one of the major dangers. They associate their disillusionment with politics and with the political class and with the elites, um, with disillusionment with uh, the system that brought them um, to where they are. So um, I, I would say, you know, one, um, it is really a matter of um, urgency for the political class itself to start rebuilding that kind of trust. And, and I think um, when you look at liberal parties, including the newer civic parties across Europe, some of them are doing a better job than others. Maybe um, some in Renew Europe, especially in France, for instance, have been 
uh, more efficient in, in doing so. Uh, the, the experience in Romania, where I'm from, um, is rather mixed in, in that regard. And there's a lot of disengagement from political parties. So there's little surprise that the populists are winning when the mainstream parties, to a large extent, are only campaigning for their core electorate. And, and what we see is a sort of cartelization, um, the dividing the market among themselves and investing in their core electorate, which they know is going to show up to vote and really disengaging from the rest. So there's, there's actually, uh, again, just like with strategic communications on an official level, there's a lot of political space that is left open to the populists. I don't think that um, political elites know how to speak to their constituencies, uh, nor do they necessarily care to do so in, in many cases, which leaves so much room for manipulation by the populists. Um, so, you know, that is, that is one thing. Then the other thing is, um, it clearly cannot be up to the government alone or to politicians alone to do that. It's something where civil society, I think, can play a vital role. Um, I think just like, you know, um, when, when we discuss so much doing media literacy classes in, in schools and high schools and, and so on, um, I, you know, I know for a fact, judging uh, by previous experience, that if we introduce this in much of our region, uh, the, the government, the authorities are going to fake doing media literacy. And they're in fact not going to do it seriously and they're not going to do it uh, in the way that it should be done, but in a self-serving manner. So then I, I would rather trust civil society organizations to do that um, than the formal public education system. Um, local authorities. Again, I, I, I think um, there's a lot in the way of rebuilding the relationship with citizens. The, the, the polarization and inequalities that Michal was mentioning are indeed extremely serious. And I think a lot of people are feeling that they don't actually belong and that nobody speaks to them. Um, and, and I think one of them major issues that we, we need to take into account is how do we rebuild communities? What we are lacking to a large extent is communities. These people end up belonging to so-called communities on social media, so Facebook groups, or they, or they um, watch manipulative mainstream media, TV channels, for instance, talk shows, for hours on end every day, because they don't feel that they belong to a real community. So they, they feel that they share something with people with whom, or, or who echo their frustrations, their fears, um, and they have, they give themselves the illusion of belonging to a community. And, and it's what we are faced with now is a kind of de-radicalization process and we cannot, I mean, I, I think we know that from uh, previous experience with de-radicalization from violent extremism, for instance, that you cannot snatch people away from a certain community that they feel they belong to unless you give them a different community to support them. Um, so really, I think this is um, where local authorities could be engaged with in trying to rebuild uh, communities and, and ways that people in general feel they belong and feel that they are truly represented politically. Um, and that, that also involves local influencers, whether they are priests um, or, uh, or TV stars or, um, I don't know, bloggers, vloggers, uh, media stars, whoever. But we need to, we don't need to convince the wide audiences. We need to convince influencers to convince their followers. That is, I think, the, the actual way of doing strategic communications these days. 
against this background of a very um, low confidence. And okay. and last uh, of all, I okay. I, I <laughs> couldn't agree more. Ah, uh, sure. No, no, sure. Uh, have your last point. We just need to finish. Uh, yeah, the, I, the the last the the last point is. Um, clearly, mainstream media is, uh, I think, in many countries as much a problem as social media. And um, um, when it comes to regulation and, and setting unified standards, um, I think we have a lot of imperfect proposals, among which the Digital Services Act, which tends to exempt the media um, from um, actual regulation. We, uh, we have not found the ideal way yet. However, I do believe that unless we come up with some form of cross-border uh, framework, then individual governments will, will step up and, and will find their own ways to regulate um, as much as they can. And given the experience with uh, the, the backsliding towards authoritarianism and autocracy in our region, I'm afraid that that kind of regulation is not going to be uh, in in the best interest of the of the citizen, but actually it's going to be just as self serving um, as as a lot of the communication and disinformation that governments themselves are perpetrating. Um, so I I do support uh, stepping up efforts to come up with a unified framework at least in, within the EU, and that could then serve as a model for other states. Uh, perfect. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, we also have a comfort of having the last panel, so we can actually go a little bit behind our our, uh, our <laughs> final final limit. So we are not that squeezed in time. Uh, but what I really like there is that uh, yeah, basically um, apart from let's say your points about the specific policies, there is definitely a clear role in politics. And if uh, liberal parties want to win elections again, they do have to do a lot of groundwork, I believe, and actually reach out to people and speak with them and try to win them over. Not by strategic communication, but rather, as you say, like through interpersonal communication. And with that, I will uh, move to, uh, I will move to, move to Michal. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I want to, to fully support Oana, because I think that uh, it's one of the key solutions to recover and to build in some cases the local identity and, uh, and um, uh, uh, local uh, communities. It is important because it is real and there are many real connections uh, and uh, relations between uh, people. Uh, when I'm looking at the, uh, this part of Poland uh, when uh, the government established uh, the state of emergency. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking about the border uh, between Belarus and Poland. Uh, and there is just about uh, 30,000 of uh, military soldiers uh, defending our country, as government is saying. But on the other hand, in many small local uh, communities. There is a huge and big organization how to support the people, the migrants, how to find them in the forest and how to help them. So it means that uh, 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 there are many uh, refugees and migrants from this way living on, all over the Poland, it's just about 30,000. And I'm not talking about the weaknesses of Polish borders. I'm talking that people, on the, on the other hand, against the propaganda and narrative done by the government, are uh, uh, ready to support and to help people. And they are creating the informal humanitarian corridor. So uh, at the local level, so I think it's crucial and also uh, um, uh, civic organizations are supporting this kind of work. Uh, and uh, uh, when I'm thinking about the regulation uh, uh, for social media, for platforms and for media, the first thing I want to emphasize is freedom of speech. Uh, and uh, I think that it is not possible uh, to uh, create completely new regulations and rules uh, for private media. 
but we, we need to remember about public media. Public media with their, it's expressed in the European legislation, should be impartial. In my country, Poland, the public media are not impartial. This is the uh, pure propaganda. So the question is how we can uh, 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 develop public media and, uh, and uh, uh, care about uh, the impartiality of the public media. It's one of the key uh, factor uh, keeping the democracy and fighting with uh, disinformation, of course. And the second point related to the regulation, it's not so easy to create and to build practical solutions in digital services art, because uh, it's clear that uh, if we will define properly and indicate as illegal some content, some content uh, it is possible to remove this content. But there is no solution for some kind of harmful content based on theory, uh, the conspiracy theories and so on and so on, because uh, it's uh, very difficult to define it in the legal way uh, uh, what we need to remove. So in my view, we need to have a regulation addressed to illegal content uh, and give some uh, new tools and make uh, platforms much more responsible. But on the other hand, we need to have this code of conduct and some kind of uh, uh, collaborative actions done by all partners. Uh, when we are using these tools uh, uh, under this code, uh, uh, it's uh, 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 clear uh, that we can uh, involve and engage citizens and users to flag that something is, uh, for example, uh, uh, dangerous and uh, representing uh, 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 the conspiracy theory, uh, and it is untrue. So I think that the composition of uh, 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 legal framework uh, and also those kind of code of conducts uh, uh, is very uh, is very important. Uh, uh, and the, the last point is related to the politicians and the hope. Uh, in my view, I'm the very old man. Uh, uh, it is uh, the core of politics to give to the people hope, but giving the hope to work on finding solutions which can guarantee the hope. I'm, I, I think that at the beginning of Polish transformation, I was involved as a Minister of Labour, we uh, uh, worked very hardly uh, it was based on solidarity movement and so on, uh, and give the people to the people uh, the hope. But now, in my view, the politics is out of real solving the real problems uh, uh, of people. So the threats are growing up. Uh, uh, politicians uh, very often are not ready to solve some complicated problems as climate challenges are and the, they are uh, uh, not ready to go forward, going forward with a dialogue with the society. So the lack of, the, of this formula of politics, I fully agree with, the, with this statement presented by, uh, uh, by, by Anna, uh, that, uh, uh, but by Anne, uh, uh, related to the, uh, to the uh, to, 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 to the famous book and so and so on. I need to end. So, so uh, I think that uh, there is a much space be, be, be before us and we need to cooperate and find the solution. It, it, it's not the hope that we can magically can change everything in one minute. We need to indicate uh, uh, the very hard road to come back to the real politics, solving real problems uh, of people and uh, regulation which will be uh, to uh, fight against some threats and also uh, act commonly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would definitely like to hear that. Uh, not hear that, I would definitely like to see that. And uh, 
Um, let's hope it will happen. Um, Anne Catherine, you have uh, the privilege to have like a let's say two three minutes of concluding concluding remarks yeah. here, and I'm sorry for going a few minutes over the over the time limit. Yeah, no problem from my side, and I'll do it very quick. So back to to what Hannah Arendt said. So I um, want to just to add like there. I don't know any politician who is complimented for saying the truth. So no one says, oh, she's a good politician because she's always the true, uh, saying the truth. Um, but, um, and, and lying is not the same as, as disinformation. So often someone is a good politician because um, she's able to do a strategic communication uh, diplomatics and, and do, being a good diplomat is um, often saying not all the information you have, which does, does not mean lying, but also lying can be a part of it. And the uh, and Hannah Arendt differentiate between lying and image making, which happened um, in the in the Vietnam War and um, where their um, Pentagon Papers came out, like the creation of, a, of an image, what happened there and what, what uh, the American soldiers are doing there. And, um, and when it comes to disinformation, there's always this um, the, the this causing of damage uh, to people that um, um, the the persons the the ones who are developing this disinformation want to do like um, um, yeah and um, you ask again why why are why is why is this problem now so big and um, I think and and why are we discussing so much about disinformation and I think from my perspective because we see um, how disinformation really causes um, um, uh, problems and, and, and sometimes severe problems in, in the real world. Um, so we see it in Germany, like we have this um, conspiracy, conspiracy theor um, theorists who are uh, try to invade our Bundestag like they did in the US and in, in, in the beginning also because of disinformation we had the severe problems in Myanmar we have them currently um, in Ethiopia we have them uh, in the Philippines the Nobel Peace uh, Prize winner uh, Maria Reza is, is ha uh, um, highly affected by disinformation and we see now that this is a really real um, security issue not only in the digital sphere, but but in the in the analog um, world too, and and affects everyone, and it affects um, a lot of politicians um, right now. And so it it I think that was the reason why it came to this broader dialogue, and also um, due to um, the pandemic that uh, people recognize, or there are people dying because of disinformation because they believe um, drinking some some fluids to get uh, the COVID uh, away um, might might help them. And um, I also want to to uh, underline what what Oana said, and and I think it's it's not enough to talk about disinformation itself, but we need to talk about broader um, societal problems we have. And I also want to underline what um, I said in the beginning is this um, confirmation bias that everyone um, is, is, can be affected by disinformation because we all have this confirmation bias. Everything that uh, fits in our world view, how we see the world um, will, will um, make us more able to spread some information that, um, that fits um, to, to what we think is correct. Perfect. Uh, unfortunately, I have to agree with that as well. <laughs> and um, yes, I think that we will wrap up here. Sorry uh, again for going over time and taking uh, more of your time than we originally asked you for. But uh, thanks a lot to all of you for your fascinating presentations and your very clever and insightful responses to my sometimes difficult, sometimes very, let's say, simple and stupid questions. So um, thank you a lot. Uh, we have to conclude here. So please join me in a final round of uh, applause to the panel.